Thank you for coming along. Uh, my name is Andrew Ramsey. I'm the General Manager uh, of Business Operations here at Alzheimer's Australia, South Australia. Before we get underway, just some housekeeping. Um, can I please remind everybody to please turn off their mobile phones or turn them to silent? Um, toilets and amenities are directly behind the building here, if you need those at any point in time. In the event of, uh, that we're required to exit in an emergency, um, follow me. I'm not that quick, but, um, but just follow me. If we go down this way, there is a mind your head sign, there's a ramp. Please don't dong your head on that, otherwise we will need an ambulance. The emergency exit location is at the rear of the building, uh, the western side at the back. Um, before we start, um, we acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional owners and custodians of, the, on the, of this land on which we meet today. We respect their spiritual relationship with country that has developed over thousands of years and the cultural heritage and beliefs that remain important to the Ghana people today. <coughs> um, September is Dementia Awareness Month nationwide and, it's the, and the theme for this month is creating a dementia friendly nation. The goal for us is to encourage Australians to become dementia aware, to have a better understanding of what it is like for a person to live with dementia and ultimately be encouraged to create communities where people with dementia are supported to live a high quality of life with meaning, purpose and value. Here at Alzheimer's Australia SA, we are actively working with the whole community to do this. A large part of Dementia Friendly is about working with organisations, government, private industry, schools, the general public and providing information so we can all better understand the disease and to help meet the needs of people living with dementia. Today we are very fortunate to have support in our mission with our national guest speaker Jill Ayling. Jill is touring the country for us to share her experiences and examples of effective dementia friendly communities in the UK and elsewhere overseas. <coughs> Jill has over 30 years of experience in the UK in the in civil service and in the last 15 years has held senior roles in central government policy and operations work. Jill currently works in the UK Department of Health and is head of the Global Action Against Dementia. She has senior level knowledge and experience of working with ministers and successful cross-sector collaborations between Whitehall, the wider public sector, independent and third sector partners, a range of professional groups, but most importantly, she has worked closely with people with dementia, their carers and their families, ensuring their views are reflected in policy decisions that will impact on them. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Jill to you now Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our special guest, Joe Ayling. Thank you, Andrew. Right, I'm just going to check. Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> the reason I ask that is, uh, in my presentation in Brisbane, this lady came up to me and gave a bit of a critique on my presentation. And it was all very constructive, but one of the things that she said was, I couldn't quite hear you. So in every single presentation now, I've taken that as constructive feedback. I asked the audience. So my name is Jill Ayling. Um, as Andrew said, I'm the head of Global Action Against Dementia. I've had a fantastic experience in Australia. I feel so at home in Australia, and I, and I don't know why, I feel quite rooted. It reminds me of home, but also doesn't, if that makes sense. Um, and I've had the opportunity to speak to a number of people, people with dementia, their carers, and meet people uh, um, who are helping to support people in health and care. And I've been interviewed on the radio, and Red Simmons, um, who's from ABC Radio, called me the grand poobah of Alzheimer's in the UK. And I understand that's probably a compliment, so <laughs> I'm, I'm quite pleased with that, because I understand he's a character, but he was a pussycat when he interviewed me. So I really want to give sincere thanks to Alzheimer's Australia for inviting me to come over. Um, I've been doing this job since 2009, um, and I've been on a real journey. So England, and I'll talk about England because we have devolved um, uh, a bit like Australia. So I actually do the work for England, but I'll talk about UK sometimes. So 2009, dementia was nowhere. And then Tony Blair and his government decided that following an NEO report, a National Audit Office report, that they wanted to develop the first ever national dementia strategy. 
And that's really important because it actually brings everybody together. And what you do is you do two or three things really well instead of 10 things really badly. And it also brings together a whole group of stakeholders who wouldn't normally come together. I was then very privileged to go to number 10 with Professor Alistair Burns, who he and I have had lots of firsts in my career with dementia. And he's the National Clinical uh, Director for Dementia. And we were sat in this very small room um, of the special advisor for the Prime Minister. And behind me was Larry the Cat. And Larry the Cat is the cat in number 10. So it was a really surreal kind of place. And I was asked then to write the Prime Minister's challenge. He's only got one health priority, and that is dementia. And for me, that has completely changed the landscape in England around dementia, because it's allowed his advocacy and his leadership to show to England and internationally what we can do. I've also had my own personal experiences of dementia. Both of my grandmas have had dementia. And I don't know how many people feel this, but it becomes like a team sport because it impacted on my whole family. And I remember my nana coming to stay with us. And after the fifth time of her going, I'm off to pay the milkman Anne-Marie, my mum said, let her go. You know, so she was tired, she was exhausted um, because she didn't quite know those different interventions. And now that we know, we could probably now say, actually, nana, the milkman's been and we've paid him. And that would have uh, reassured her, and she probably wouldn't have walked up and down the street about five times. But, you know, hey, that was in the 70s. I do this in every single one of my presentations, because I think it's really important to gauge the room. Can I ask for you to put your hand up if you know somebody with dementia, a loved one, or just are aware of it? Yeah, and it's always the same. So you can imagine this across the whole world. So if, I would say about 90% of people in this room put their hand up. So the impact dementia is having across the world and in Australia is huge. So I really like this cartoon. I wonder if you can see it. And for me, this sums it up. So I've been in Sydney, so I've been in Australia for about four weeks and we've hired an apartment my husband and I my daughter and she's 15 and she's beautiful she's taller than me skinny hair down to her bottom and as we're walking down the high street in Sydney all the boys are staring at her and I thought at what point did that change in my life <laughs> and I just wanted to quote the late Terry Pratchett who said inside every old person is a younger person wondering what happened <laughs> however I think we should celebrate aging as I'm aging, I'm becoming wiser. I remember when I was 19, 20 and the silly things that I was doing. I'm now 48. I'm no, I know you all don't think that I'm 48, but I am. Uh, and I think I've got a range of experiences and knowledge. And I feel that that should be celebrated. And the baby boomers need to also think about what's happening to them. So my dad and my grandma and my uh, granddad didn't have those expectations that I have. I expect certain things to happen, and that should be the case. And I really think the litmus test for us is that we need to do that heavy lifting for those that are coming through for this aging population who want to have good services, who want to still remain in their own communities and live independently. Because you and I, one, three of us in this room, if you haven't already got dementia, may get dementia. So we need to think about how we prepare the health and care systems in our communities so we can support those people better. I'm going to have to keep turning, knowing that it's, that it's moved on. You may know these figures, but I think they have to repeat it, because I think the magnitude of them could overwhelm us unless we take control. There's nearly 50 million people worldwide with dementia, and that's the recent stats in the World Health Organization. Globally, that's going to increase to 136 million by 2050. In Australia, there are 343,000 people living with dementia. In the UK, there's 850,000. 
I don't know if you've been aware of the Martin Prince report. Martin Prince is a great guy, and he's looked into modifiable risk factors for dementia, but he's also looked at the impact of dementia on low- to middle-income developing countries, because as those countries are surviving HIV and AIDS, the prevalence of dementia is starting to increase. So we as a global society need to start thinking about our, our partners and our other countries who this is starting to happen to. And this is why the G7 work that I'm leading needs to go much wider. We need to think about those countries who are starting to be affected. Can I ask colleagues if people are aware of Margaret Chan? So Margaret Chan is the Director General for the World Health Organization. She's smaller than me and she's like a pocket rocket. And she's a formidable, feisty lady, and I love feisty women. But actually, the thing I really like about her is the fact that she wanted to support dementia, and she saw dementia as being one of the biggest challenges across the World Health Organization, and therefore has put her leadership and support behind it. And I just wanted to quote what she said at the first ever ministerial conference that we held in March 2015 in Geneva. She said, I can think of no other disease that has such a profound effect of loss of function, loss of independence, and the need for care. I can think of no other de disease so deeply dreaded by anyone who wants to age gracefully and with dignity. I can think of no other disease that places such a heavy burden on families, communities, and societies. I can think of no other disease where innovation, including breakthrough discoveries to develop a cure, is so badly needed. And for me, that really sums up my journey since 2009. It's just over a century ago that Dr. Alzheimer first described the distinctive plaques and tangles that the disease bears his name. Over a hundred years on, there's still no means to cure or slow the progression. In 15 years, just four drugs have been developed none of which slows the progress. However, there is some hope. Eli Lilly recently announced it's a drug that it's got on the market at the moment, that it's in the clinical stages. And this is for early onset dementia. And how fantastic it was for me when I was in Brisbane and a gentleman came up to me and told me that his wife was on the drug. And I said, how is she doing? And he said, she's great. <laughs> And even now I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it because it just gives you that hope. It slows down the progression of the disease. It's got a long way to go yet, this clinical trial. But if it's successful, then we could start to see early onset of people getting an early diagnosis, slowing down the disease. Exactly that we did for HIV and AIDS. And I just want to compare uh, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia with other breakthroughs and other discoveries in disease areas. I recently commissioned my team to do some research into other disease areas on what were their breakthroughs because my big motto is copy, copy, copy. Never reinvent the wheel. If you can learn from other areas, we should do. And cancer is one of those areas. A half century of progress in oncology shows us that breakthroughs will come from insights at the molecular level. Like cancer, dementia is many diseases and multiple treatments will probably be needed. It won't be just one fix. Progress will be made in small, incremental advances, gathering momentum so that disease groups become amenable to treatment and cure over time. One of the things that I talk about in my presentation is, as we're waiting for the cure tomorrow, we need to think about the care today. There are nearly 50 million people with dementia, 343,000 in Australia, and we need to think creatively about the support we give. So if Ian, who's got just been diagnosed with dementia. We need to think about what care we're giving him. For Alan, who I met in Tasmania, for Trevor, who I do a lot of work with in the UK, we need to think about their care. And therefore, I'm really wanting to highlight the importance of what's good for your heart is good for your head. And what do I mean by that? I think there's evidence that you can significantly reduce your risk by making simple changes to your lifestyle. Diabetes, Midlife obesity and midlife hypertension each show evidence that the risk of dementia is increased. There are those out there that question the evidence 
for some or all of these risk factors. The advice is common sense and can only be positive and there's no downside to that. If there's any chance that actually thinking about um, your lifestyle, uh, being moderate in your drinking, taking exercise can have any impact, why wouldn't you do it? And Hilary Doxford, who's got early onset dementia, is a member of the World Dementia Council, and that's what she said. When the council was starting to debate the actual evidence that is there worldwide, and she said, guys, I don't care if there's evidence there or not. For me, if there's some hope of this happening, you should promote it and you should ensure that everybody knows it. And one of the things that we've been doing in the UK is we've been working with the NHS and every year, 55 and upwards have a health check. And within those health checks, we're talking to people about what's good for your heart is good for your head. Because actually, if you can get that information early, then it's really helpful and it's starting to work. And a lot of people didn't realise that actually there are modifiable risk factors. And this is why we're working with other charities. Because I think dementia shouldn't try and compete with other disease areas. It should collaborate. The charities should collaborate because what's good for dementia is good for everything else. So when I was in Australia in November, the World Dementia Envoy, I was really taken by the work that Australia's doing around risk reduction. And have you heard of the Brainy app that Alzheimer's Australia? So if you haven't, please go on. It's a fantastic app that literally gives you a quick check on your own risk assessment, your lifestyle and your medical condition, and then it tells you what you need to do. So I would really, really encourage you to do that. If we're to beat dementia, we must also work globally with nations, business and scientists from all over the world, working together as we did with cancer and with HIV and AIDS. That's a quote from David Cameron from the G8 summit in 2013. For me, that was another seminal moment. I sat there in the massive auditorium for that G8 summit as the world's press were outside and the world leaders were about to arrive. And Professor Burns and I sat there going, isn't this amazing? Who would have thought in 2009 that the world leaders would be jetting in to talk about dementia and talk about what they're going to do within their countries? And this is when I was asked then to lead that G8 declaration. So the G8 signed up to a number of things that they would do. And I have cajoled, I have bullied, I have uh, coerced and I've done everything in my powers to ensure that those countries um, uh, you know deliver on the commitments that they signed up to. I'm really proud to have been involved in that work so what has that included? So I've been involved in four legacy events so four major countries agreed to host events uh, around the world. We held the first one in London around finance Canada then held their events around the relationships between academia and industry. It's really important that academia and industry work together. And that's been demonstrated through the research I did with other disease areas. And that's where they found their common ground. So one person's failure is another person's success. And we should share that. Then I went to Japan, which was amazing. Has anybody been to Japan? amazing, amazing place. I'm going for the 2020 Olympics, uh, so I'm really super excited. And they did prevention and care models, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what I saw there. And then US did research. We've appointed Dennis Gillings, the World Dementia Envoy. He is such an advocate and a leader. His mum had dementia, and he's so, so passionate about ensuring that we do get a cure or disease-modifying therapy. Then we set up the World Dementia Council, and there's about 16 or 17 people on that from all over different sectors. But the most important person for me on that World Dementia Council is Hilary Doxford, who's got dementia. 21 countries have a national plan and eight in development. When I first came to Australia, I was very conscious of not criticizing the Australian government because you don't have a plan, you have a framework. I've become a bit bolder 
now that I'm into my fourth week. And when I met the senior civil servants and the parliamentarians yesterday, I said, you need a plan. If you do not have a plan, you have nothing to work together. You don't have something that builds momentum, that builds those synergies and partnerships. And I know that because I've done it myself. And I really recommended that they get on and do it. We had the first ministerial conference in Geneva in 2015, and this was also a fantastic moment. 98 countries signed up to that call for action. Margaret Chan said no other disease area, no other, no other event had achieved that, and that was fantastic. At that event, our Secretary of State for Health Jeremy Hunt announced the first ever Dementia Discovery Fund, and this is a public-private partnership between UK government and industry. Industry have been walking off the pitch because actually uh, there are only four drugs on the market and it's very expensive to develop a drug from bench to patient. They're coming back in and I think this is due to the work that we've been doing globally and the, um, uh, the, the raising of the profile of our leaders across the world. A hundred million dollars, it's just a start. And this is at the pre-clinical stage getting early assets through so you can get them through that pipeline and that's really really important i just thought i'd give you a little bit of an insight in what we've been doing in the uk so as i said 850,000 people with dementia we had a diagnosis rate of about 40 percent we're now up to 65 more people in England are getting a diagnosis than ever before, and that is so important, because the sooner that you get it, the sooner you understand what's happening to you, the sooner that your families know how to help support you and also get support themselves. Alan, who I met with early onset in Tasmania on Friday, he's in respite four days a week, and Cathy, his wife, said, without that respite, I would fall over. So it's really important that we develop those services for the carers and also for those people with dementia. We've also got 105 dementia-friendly communities. So what does that mean? So we've worked with people with dementia and they told us that they want to find their way around and feel safe in their community. They want to access local facilities, banks, shops, cafes, cinemas. And they want to maintain their social networks. Ian was just talking about being engaged in his Italian uh, community and being, you know, walking around the shops and they now know him and he's getting free fruit and veg, you understand, Ian? Great. <laughs> Let me give you a tangible example of what a dementia-friendly community is. Trevor Jarvis, who's got vascular dementia from Doncaster, and he is such a character. And he wants to remain independent. And he and his wife do a lot of presentations and they're a really strong unit together. But he said, I don't want her spending all my money just because I can't access it. He can't remember his pin and, uh, chip and pin anymore. So he went to Lloyds Bank in England and said, what are you gonna do to support me? And they said, okay, Trevor, if you can't remember your chip and pin, how about using your signature? And he's now able to access his money. And I cannot tell you the impact that's had on his life. And as a consequence of that, Lloyds Bank are now supporting anybody with dementia, as long as it's safe and secure, to find a way of, so that they can also access their money. So that's a really tangible example of what a dementia-friendly community is. Uh, we also have dementia friends, and I'm really supporting this. So is anybody in the room a dementia friend? So this is my badge, I don't know if you can see it. It's a, um, a forget-me-not, and that's the emblem. I found it in Japan four years ago. Japan are amazing. They really support each other as citizens and as, you know, as, as, as families. And they developed that what they called caravan mates. I don't know why they call it caravan mates. The emblem are two donkeys. It doesn't really matter. It's what it means. And we in, the, in England have been doing Dementia Friends and we've got a million. Japan have got eight million. And I'm a Dementia Friends champion, so I can train others, it takes a day. But to become a, cha to become a Dementia Friend, it takes an hour, 40 minutes tops. You can also do it online. And what we do is we tell people about the things you need to know. 
the small things that you need to know about dementia. So it breaks down the stigma and raises awareness. So what do you think those five things are? What's the five things that you should know about dementia? Come on. It's not age related. Exactly. That's really, really important. Um, I've been in a number of taxis and they all ask me about why I'm here. And when I tell them, they go, oh, that's all about aging, isn't it? No, it's not. It's a disease. It's a disease of the brain. It's not just about losing your memory either. It can affect communication and everyday tasks. It's possible to live well with it. And I'm hoping, listening to Ian, we can hear about how he's living with dementia. And there's more to the person than the dementia. If I was to get dementia, I hope that people remember or know about my life, that my career, my family, the things that I enjoy. I think it's really important that we encourage people with dementia to write down their life stories. Because what that means is, is that if for any reason you have to go into a care home, that those people around you know what you like and you dislike. And that has a real impact on your behaviour. And let me give you an example. I was in a care home recently and the care home manager said we had a gentleman who was very, very agitated and kept trying to open the doors, open and lock the doors. And when they spoke to his family, they found out that he worked in a prison. And he thought he was still working in that prison. And he needed to open the doors in the morning and lock them at night. So what did they do? They got a block of wood and just put some locks in it. So every morning he unlocked and every night he locked. And the, re and the impact that had on his behaviour. And I recently did some work around a reduction of antipsychotic my, uh, medication. And it's so important to think about the individual, personalised care, instead of just automatically going for that chemical cosh. And it's those small interventions that make those differences. Within the Dementia Friends training, we do some scenarios. And we talk about the penny, the one penny piece. And we say to people, right do the two circles, the front and back, and write what's on that penny. And it doesn't really matter how many you get. It's actually watching people as they're doing it and how agitated and frustrated they get. And what we say to them afterwards is, that's a thing that you see every day and you can't bring it to your memory. How do you think a person with dementia must feel if they can't remember the basic things like brushing their teeth, making a cup of tea? So instead of de-skilling people with dementia, then think about the things that you can do. So label the kettle. One of the things that Trevor talks about is, as long as he has his routine in the morning, he can do lots of things. So he gets up in the morning, he makes this cup of tea for him and Anne, and he gets dressed. One morning, Anne got up and made the cup of tea, and he was completely out of sync. And he said to her, stay in bed and just wait for your cup of tea. And I think that's just demonstrating that he wants to remain with her for as long as he can, but he has to do certain things in a certain way. And as long as he does that, he's fine. He also wants to wear a tie. My dad always wears a shirt and tie. It's just that generation. So Travis's son tied all his ties and just loosened them and hung them on hangers in his wardrobe. So all he does every morning is put it over and pushes it up. Simple. We've also been doing work with um, about a thousand organisations. It's called the Dementia Action Alliance. It started with 50. And what they do is, and I'm a chair of it, they think of two or three things a year that they can do really well. And this is carers, this is people with dementia, this is GPs, pharmacists, nurses, and they all sign up to become part of this alliance. And the first thing we did was we tried to reduce antipsychotic medication because we did a review on it. We didn't do it through government. I didn't stand on the podiums and go to the NHS and say, there must do. 
We did it from the grassroots up. So we worked with pharmacists and hospitals, we'd worked with GPs, and we developed a red flag system. So when people were discharged from hospital and those GPs saw that individual, they knew they were on an anti antipsychotic, and then they talked to the person with dementia and their families about how to get them off that antipsychotic. We used nurses and GPs to actually challenge each other and that's how we got the changes. And that's when you see it happening in the DNA of your communities. I remember the first time being behind an ambulance and it had a Dementia Friends badge on the back of it. Imagine how that must feel. Every hospital in England is dementia friendly. <clears throat> they have the butterfly campaign which identifies people in hospital who've got dementia. And it's the simple things. They have different colour crockery. Because it's not the nursing staff, even though we train the nursing staff. It's the uh, orderlies that come on and feed people. And if those people with dementia haven't eaten or drunk, they actually say to them, why haven't you done that? Because people with dementia need to eat and they need to drink because they become disorientated. And that's not good. And we've got evidence to demonstrate that people with dementia stay longer in hospital. So it's actually cost benefit for people to be looked after well in hospital because it means they come out otherwise they could end up going into a care home or going into crisis i also want to talk to you about the work we've been doing with schools it's really important that we have that intergenerational work with children because actually if you build that awareness with children then the stigma changes so we're starting to work with the scouts and brownies in england and they're going to be working on the Dementia Friends badges. And I think that's amazing. So I wanted to just give you a little kind of run through of leaders. Leadership rots from the top. If you've got a good leader, things happen. And I'm a true advocate of that in my own team and wherever I've gone. If you've got a good leader, you'll follow them and you'll do as they say. So I've got a collage of different leaders behind me. And I was really impressed to hear that Tony Abbott recently left his signature budgie smugglers, I hear, uh, and that's quoting the Australian Mail, and actually braved the cold to catch some ways for dementia fundraising initiative. I think it's really important that our leaders show their support for dementia because then that means that others do it as well. It's really unfortunate that I can't show you the Dementia Friends video that I brought with me. But what I'll do is I'll make sure that I share my slides with colleagues here today so you can go online. It's the thing that's most impressed people about my presentation, so I don't know whether that's a compliment or not. But it's a video that we pulled together. We got, the, um, we got Sir Paul McCartney to agree to let us use his song with a little help from his, with my friends. And the person in the video is called Gina and she has dementia. And it's celebrities from England and internationally all saying, I can get by with a little help from my friends. And we had it prime time. And I mean prime time, Coronation Street prime time. <laughs> so I was like screaming around the house like a banshee when it was on. But I also just want to share some of my experiences globally. I've been really fortunate to see things. So I met Pepper the robot when I was in Japan. And she's a little robot about knee high. And she's been placed in care homes and in people's own homes. And she plays music. Music's really important for people with dementia, for any of us. So I was saying this morning to Andrea, I'm off to see Duran Duran in November in Leeds. I know when I sit when they play their first set, I'll close my eyes and I'm 18 with my hair back combed, dancing a frenzy with my friends. And it takes me to that good place. And I think music is so important. It raises your spirits and takes you to a place that you've, you remember. I remember seeing a video of a gentleman with early onset dementia and he hadn't spoken for a long time. And it was really distressing for his wife and they started to use music therapy and they played the song that they danced to at their wedding. And he reached, when, when that song was played, he reached over to her and held her hand. And that was the first contact he'd had with her for about six months. And I think that demonstrates the importance of music. So back to Pepper. So she's got this little video inside of her, but she can also pick up changes in the person with dementia. And that means that they can feed back to the carers and also uh, to, to loved ones as well. 
When I tweeted, because I'm an avid tweeter, so follow me if you want to, uh, back to England, I got a really bad reaction to Pepper the Robot. And it's not what I wanted to do. Because people in England, their culture and behaviour around innovation and technology is very, very different from the Japanese. And they said, this is disgraceful, this is replacing hands-on care. And that's not what I was saying. And as I said, as we wait for the cure tomorrow, we need to think about the care today in innovations, in technology and other ways. We need to, we need to open our arms to all of them because all can help support people with dementia and their carers. I was also really impressed with the virtual dementia experience by Alzheimer's Australia. Have people seen it? So when I was here in November, it's a simulation of how it feels to have dementia and going into your own home. And it's the one thing that I picked up and I wasn't even aware of it. So I'll just give you one example. The person goes into the house and she starts to pull away and she becomes really agitated and the carer doesn't know why. And when they play it back to you, they show you what she's seeing and there's a mat on the front as you go in. And that person with dementia, all they could see was a hole. So it's those small interventions and they use it now in care homes, in hospitals, in order to educate people who are looking after people with dementia. And it's won this award. And when I was there in Parliament yesterday, I said, I would encourage every MP that's got a health and care portfolio to watch that virtual dementia experience. And it's only five minutes or so, because that will show you what it feels like to have dementia. And you can then use that to go forward and do better things. And it would really show to you the simple things that you can do. And I had a lot of people nodding in the audience that they were going to do it. So coming back to your question about dementia friends, when I met with the bureaucrats, and this is what you all call me, civil servants, uh, yesterday, they said that they wanted to work with Alzheimer's Australia to develop the first dementia friends program in Australia. And Graham, uh, um, uh, Samuel, who's the president of Alzheimer's Australia, as he left him at the airport yesterday, he said, I'm determined to ensure that Australia has dementia friends. I've agreed to help the civil servants because we developed it, to share all the resources, copy, 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 so that they can do it. The MP who was up said, I want to call it Dementia Mates. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's what you're doing. It's the small differences you make. But it's also really important that if you become a dementia friend, you do something that has an outcome. Don't just do it and think, right, and now go back to work or go home. So when I did it, I live in a really small village in Yorkshire. And I went down to my post office. And I said to the postmistress, you've got lots of people coming in here of an older population. Can I just help you become more aware of dementia? And she said, yes. So that was my contribution back to my uh, village. And it's those types of things. It's talking about it. It's telling other people to become dementia friends. It's just recognising. We're also working with businesses. So Marks and Spencers in the UK now trains all its staff. We've got the electricity, the gas firms, the police, the fire brigade. It's about the DNA of society. It's the day-to-day -day services that come across people with dementia that can really make that difference if they are aware. So when I was in Tasmania, I don't play this, uh, but it's the Bionic Man, and Alan wanted me to play it. And if you can imagine, if you remember the Bionic Man, as the music was going up, it was going, I can go further, I can go faster. And this is how I think in my head. We should never become complacent because we don't have a cure yet. So we have to keep going. It's really important that we recognise that dementia doesn't recognise national boundaries. Status, wealth, neither will solutions. No one country, organisation, sector or individual can do it on their own. We all have to do this together. We need to learn lessons from other disease areas like HIV and cancer. We need a commitment to tackle the science. 
and we need to think about a strategic response across all of the sectors and we need to move from a G7 response to a global response. So I've been working now uh, with a number of countries, including Australia, and I'm trying to encourage the Australian government to get involved in risk reduction and to take forward that work as part of the wider global work. I think we are on the right trajectory, but as I talked about, the increasing costs. So the parliamentarians and the civil servants are very impacted by budgets, and so are we in the UK. So we did have funding when we started the National Dementia Strategy, but I've seen my funding cut, so I've thought innovatively. Dementia friends, dementia friendly communities do not cost a lot of money. Those interventions I've talked about in hospitals and care homes do not cost a lot of money. And we have to be cognizant of the fact of the economy, but I think we can provide good quality services for people with dementia and their carers that are not going to uh, create additional burdens. But it, they're also cost benefit. If you're getting people out of hospital quicker, that's a cost benefit. We need to think about pricing. If Eli Lilly is successful in seven to eight years, and we've not got a drug that people can afford, what has been the point? So I'm working really closely with industry and the scientists and governments about getting affordable drugs. We need to improve the science. Scientists need to share their failures so that others can pick them up and that could end up being a success for them. And we need to think about the stigma. There's still a stigma of dementia and we need to raise that awareness. In Africa, people are thought of as witches. Through my travels and the work that I've done, and I really like this cartoon. I thought I'd summarise what I've learned and what are the things that you need to do to make things happen. Because actually, it doesn't happen by magic. You need political endorsement. David Cameron and others have demonstrated that. Without it, you won't get that endorsement elsewhere. You need performance management. You need to have data. Because if you don't have data, you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, you don't know whether you've progressed. And you can't then help those organisations learn from those who are doing well. You need organisations to work together. Without Alzheimer's Society in the UK, I could not have done what I've done, and vice versa. We're also now working with a whole group of charities, because I said, I think what's good for your heart is good for your head, and I'm working with all those charities so that we don't compete against each other, but that we work together. Funding is important and is critical, and I've talked about how you can make those interventions that show cost benefit. And you need that media engagement. If you can get the movement, and if you can get the awareness. So I was on TV, uh, and I was very privileged to be on TV in Melbourne recently. And people were emailing me who knew me in the UK that have moved to Perth. My daughter saw it online because her friend who's emigrated to Australia was eating her breakfast in Rose Bay in Sydney and texted my daughter and said, your mum's on TV, you know? But it's about getting those messages out and it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you get them out there. I just want to leave you with one last thought. There are so many people out there who will tell you that you can't. What you've got to do is turn around and say, watch me, because that's what we did in England. I think dementia is, isn't contagious, but hope is. Thank you, everybody. Um, look, thank you, Jewel. Um, very enlightening speech, and I'm really uh, excited to hear that Dementia Friends is something that's going to take off in Australia. There could be nothing more important, and that's certainly going to help, I guess, start the reduction of stigma, um, start the conversation, and, uh, and take us where we all want to go.